Our guests in the studio are going to talk about urbanizing Africa. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Urbanizing. You know, urban does not necessarily mean Nairobi. Even Nanyuki can be transformed into urban. It's, Sour. It's true. Yeah. Before we welcome them and say hello to them, let me give you today's proverb uh, on behalf of CT. It's from which country? Cote d'Ivoire. If you're not going to bite, don't show your teeth. If you're not going to bite, don't show your teeth. Better just shut up. Kabza? Yeah, coil your tail and go. Just coil your tail and go. Sit at the corner. Samuel Orlando, Executive Director of Pomoja Trust, is back in the studio uh, along with his, with his usual friend, <laughs> <laughs> Jamin Kiswania, who is the head of Rebuild, Rebuild Advocacy, all right, at uh, International Rescue Committee. Good morning, gentlemen. Good to have you again on the show. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to have you. After many things have changed in the landscape, many things have changed in the urban areas. <laughs> too. Mm-hmm. Sana, senior. Yes. Where? Hey. Last time you were here, there was a different president and a different governor. Imagine yeah. many things. And different changed. MCAs. Many things have changed in terms of governance. Yes. <laughs> As Pomoja Trust, you're dealing with different people. Now you have to introduce yourselves to a whole new realm of people. Exactly. Especially when it comes to urban areas. Exactly. Uh-huh. And the last time you were here, you were speaking about the People's Manifesto. Yes. And now <laughs> you're in a different phase. Uh-huh. So it's an interesting uh, space that now we discuss urban issues again with a new regime. Mm. Very good. But the F- People's Manifesto is still alive still alive and kicking yep finding its life within the county integrated development plans very good because that's that's a stage we are in now right exactly the all the counties around the country are now at the point of formulating the CIDPs which are five year plans i was having a conversation with somebody yesterday and he was telling me, so these plans you know they're just very high level ambitions they are not uh, financed or budgeted do they translate to the annual development does the cidp five year translate into annual development plan translate into annual budget really true because you see the cidp the cidp process mm. uh, acknowledges that then we will have uh, priorities for each of the particular counties so they prioritize the sectors they even prioritize the populations and the person that they certainly want to target Uh, for instance, right now we have been pushing for vulnerable persons. We have been pushing for inclusion of refugees within that particular space. And uh, the annual development plans need then to emanate from the CIDP. That the annual development plan cannot be on priorities or on sectors that were not exactly defined from the very uh, beginning. And so in terms of financing, uh, from where we sit is that uh, let's have a plan within the CIDP. Let's then agree in terms of costing. Then we will know what exactly governments can be able to raise in terms of revenue, which ones they can be able to borrow. But then if you don't then have a plan, it becomes difficult for you then to be able to say we can't meet this or we can't meet that. Mm. It's good that we have a plan that speaks in terms of what we want to achieve by the end of the day. Mm. Then we can work out the aspect of financing and we have fidelity that the annual development plans are actually based on the CIDP. But Jamin... This is now the third CIDP that we're going to have. Yes. The previous two. Look at those previous two. Can we say that counties have actually implemented the CIDPs? We uh, give the dev- the devil what's due. Okay. We have had significant progress within the counties. When you look at where we were in 2012, and even now it will actually be informing the urbanization aspect that we're having is that uh we have had significant progress we have had opening up of rural areas we have had some development initiatives happening in some of those particular particular counties we have not reached where we need to be but then we appreciate that uh, once we are doing the review of for instance the last uh, five year program mm. then you're looking at what exactly happened in a particular county what were the misses and why what i am hesitant in seeing in this mm-hmm. aspect of CIDP is that us coming with new things completely if we didn't achieve what we had in the last 5 year term yeah so that it's better than we look at what new devices 
how better than we actually work to improve the first the last CIDP instead of coming up with new novel ideas that uh, we were not able to achieve the last 10 years hmm. <laughs> you are not convinced uh, Latif but i want to link this to the urban october uh. And in the urban October, we are saying that we mind the gap. We leave no one behind and we leave no place behind. Mm. And we also appreciate that there's a pandemic of inequality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's no longer the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the pandemic of inequality. And as uh, Kenya is uh, urbanizing, it's estimated that by 2050, yeah. half of our population will be living in the urban areas. Yeah. And you look at the counties that Jamin is speaking about is that uh, uh, they are developing and rapidly urbanizing at the nodes. You know, when you look at uh, you know the rural counties where we house the county government and the county assemblies, they are developing at, uh, on these nodes, and people are coming to the city to seek you know opportunities, to seek to innovate, to seek to contribute to the development of their counties. But then. When we were last here, we did speak about the People's Manifesto, and now I'm trying to link it to the CIDP mm. so that then we get to where Jamin is. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, there's an assumption that perhaps the vision that we have in the CIDPs do not match resource allocation, but we agree this movement towards the right direction. We're in the third generation CIDP. When you look at uh, Nairobi City County government now, and we must loud the new governor, uh, you know, by basically by opening up the space for engagement, consulting organized groups, consulting civil society organizations mm. through the s sector working groups. It allows us as a people to reflect jointly with government mm -hmm. and say this is where we were in the second generation CIDPs. These are w the things we achieved. These were the pitfalls. Yeah, this is what we can do better. And that's happening in Nairobi City County Government. That's happening in Kisumu uh, County Government. Mm. Uh, in as much as I appreciate the reflective moment in the sun, I mean, it's great. Uh, but as you said, it's a pandemic. Pandemic notes waits for nobody. Mm. It's not going to sit down and say, well, we've had a chat mm. and let's see then what we can do. Mm. No, no. It's going to keep ravaging. It's going to come up with variants, as we've seen. It's going to affect many people differently. Mm. It's going to kill some people. Mm. It's going to make sure that somebody's mm. economic situation is worsened before it gets better. Mm. You can't sit aside and reflect for too long. Mm. Something needs to be done. So this is the question. When are we going to get beyond this thing of saying, well, you know, it's okay because the space has been opened up. We've had a conversation and say, look, we've got to put people to task and say, these things need to be done. We need to start, you know, reducing the gap. We need to start making sure that the livelihoods of those people who are in a vulnerable position actually starts to be affected in a positive manner. I feel the itch to say <laughs> we seem to be just saying well since we're talking about it it's okay in as much mm -hmm. as i appreciate that mm -hmm. having the conversation is important i am itching for a time when everybody is saying we cannot sit around and just speak we must do thank you i think uh urban october uh, and it's good that we're in that october mm. uh, urban october is about providing an opportunity for various parties to be able to discuss about the opportunities and the challenges mm -hmm. that are brought by the fast rising of uh, cities and urbanizations in general. We acknowledge that uh, we have uh, various issues within urban centers and that, uh, for instance, when we look at uh, Nairobi, we acknowledge that we have various uh, urban centers, mm. but then the cities uh, those mm. particular areas that are worst hit by some of these particular issues. Mm. And uh, the urbanization uh, front, we see various things. One, we not about the rural urban migration. We note that, uh, as uh, Sam put it, that by the year 2050, uh, the projections are that 68% uh, of persons will be living in urban areas. Mm. Mm. Currently, we are at 56%. Nairobi is no exception. But then when we look at uh, the other aspects, like the cost of living crisis. The cost of living crisis affects people living in urban areas more than it affects people living in the urban area, in the, the, the rural, rural areas. Area. Mm. Yeah. It is worse to eat in informal settlements than in formal settlements. The other day we're having a conversation and therefore we are reminded of uh, what we call the 
the poverty penalty yeah. that uh, you are actually penalized for being poor mm. which would definitely mean that uh, persons who are in the low pyramid actually spend a lot of money to access basic services mm. than people who are rich and uh, when you look at some of the informal statements that we have is that uh, a 20 liter jerry can going for about 20 shillings and if those particular people on average have to spend about 1000 liters in a month then uh, you are seeing they spend on water 1000 bob mm-hmm. that is one unit one unit of water being spent at 1000 bob when you mm-hmm. know on average then people who have piped water in this particular city will be paying about 180 200 yep. for one unit of, of of water and so we continue to see this aspects of inequality the cost of living crisis has left the urban populations ravaged completely and so as we have the engagement about inequalities is then looking at how then do we can we be able to bring together to ensure that vulnerable people as many people as possible are actually included within this particular space it's even astounding to think that uh 1 billion people within the globe live in slums mm. yeah uh in uh, in Kenya the population is that uh, 46.5% of people living in urban areas actually live in slums and so this is characterized by poor housing yep and availability of water uh poor infra- sanitation uh, sanitation infrastructure and right now mm. we have the effects of uh, climate change actually also affecting this particular particular population mm. and so as unto say is that we come from this particular background mm. to acknowledge first in terms of what are the issues that we find ourselves in what are the situa- what is the situation what is it that we need to be pr- to be prosecuting and working uh, and working with then we identify in terms of w- what have been the gaps where are we and what has led us to be where we are at the moment then i think also then the problems are actually uh, running far ahead of us such that the limited resources we have in annual budgets will never ever be able to catch up with the needs of this growing urban population so if you look at the urbanization so by how much has nairobi's population for example grown between the 2009 census and the 2019 census right it's grown by close to a million plus right it's going to grow by another a million or more within the next couple of years are you foreseeing a situation where this huge urban population that is continuing to live in the low income neighborhoods that coming to live in the slum areas going to access education health uh, those basics water like you said jamin or sanitation like you said what needs to happen so that then we can actually bring mukuru and madare and the others up to par with the other uh, neighborhoods in Nairobi so that by the time more and more people are coming and president ruto is building houses 250,000 per year and let's say 50,000 of them are in Nairobi they are actually then coming to find new people moving into Nairobi move, moving into those new houses you're very right latif and uh, it's estimated that uh, approximately 70% of the population in Nairobi will be in informal settlements mm. uh, now as we speak but there are two approaches to that that yes we speak about it but when we speak about it without putting it in a policy document then we will not have the opportunity to, to review at the end of the five years mm-hmm. because it will be hearsay if i'm not mm. wrong mm. <laughs> <laughs> so then now we have an opportunity to put it in the policy document mm. but also as we do that then we critique the approaches for instance the urban renewal and regeneration programs similar to the launching of the houses mm. that we saw the other day mm. the question is the extent to which the population it's targeting are able to afford mm-hmm. that would be the first question that you've got intermittent income how will mamboga with an intermittent income be able to invest in the national security NSE I don't know anything about it but uh, hopefully mm. uh, perhaps I may try to make sense out of it to what extent will they be able to access the Kenya mortgage refinancing company mm. resources to access the house mm. 
And that's what we've been constantly telling government, and that's what we are trying to discuss with the Nairobi City County government, by telling them that there are innovations that these communities have done you know, to live within their situations. Why are they not finding themselves, the, the innovations finding them, their footing into policy documents? You know, for why, example, for example, yeah. housing cooperatives that mm. is run in Kibra. Mm. How is housing cooperative linked to Kenya Mortgage Financing Company that is delivering the housing units mm. that President Ruto is launching? So that then it's realizable, you know, and you know it makes sense to the communities. When you talk about climate change and food systems, what are the adaptations of the toy market? Mm. Mm. And what is happening at toy market? M may I ask? Does entrenching an idea in a policy document guarantee the implementation of said idea? Because we, we almost make it seem as though by virtue of it being in a policy document, that's going to guarantee that it's actually being done. And if that's the case, if we look through, let's just look at urban the urban policies in the country. How many that have gone into a policy document have actually been given life? It, by virtue of the fact that a policy document exists. It legitimizes it. Mm. So it, because it's legitimized, I can actually sit on this policy document for 20 years. But right? It, it becomes but a, because it's in a document, mm. I, somebody can still say, well, it's all right because it's in a document. Somebody somewhere down the line is going to do it. And I think that's my issue. Mm. I think because what? it's in a document, then we say, oh, it's all right. It's mm. in a document. So somebody's going to do it. And then somebody can get away with murder. Mm. Because it's in a document and the implementation is the problem. I think we, we all acknowledge that uh, implementation is a problem yeah. of uh, these respective policies. But then the informality, the informality on our issues uh, handled within the communities themselves, mm. they shut the door for government engagement, for financing and for budgeting processes. And so the very first step then would be how then do we formalize the informality that actually exists? Mm -hmm. How do we bring forth the community conversations that happen? How do we bring them to the stage where then they can definitely be listened? Yesterday, there was a conversation at uh, Jivanji Gardens, Bungila, Bungila Wanainchi. Wanainchi. Mm. And Bungila Wanainchi has always been happening. Mm. But then if then Bungila Wanainchi and the issues that affect the communities are not brought within the invited spaces, where development planning and conversation happen, mm. then they will simply just remain there. And so we acknowledge that uh, the very first step is to formalize the informality aspect that happening in the community. Mm -hmm. But then that is not the end. Mm. Because then the aspect of formalizing them is the aspect of coming up with policy papers and mm. having that. But that is not the end. But once we have that at that particular stage, then we move towards looking at then how do we implement these particular policies? Now that we acknowledge this exists within the communities, these are the inequalities, this is exactly what we want to do, this is the approach, how then do we push towards this? Mm. And that's why once we have uh, policy documents that uh, begin finding their space within the CIDP, then we begin saying, look, we have this particular policy papers and policy direction finding themselves within the budgeting cycle and activities of a particular county. Then we begin setting the stage of saying we are actually going to be actualizing this. But we acknowledge this country has many policies. I mean, it has been said that uh, we are not short of good writings mm. in that. <laughs> We're just short of the aspects of uh, implementation. Mm. It is unfortunate that the failure to implement this leads to a majority of the population, especially in, in, in urban areas. Nairobi is estimated that 60% of people live in slums. Mm. And so we have majority of those particular categories of persons suffering by the end of the day. What need not to be forgotten is that uh, even within those populations, we still have a uh, different strata of persons who are more vulnerable than others. Mm. Mm. We're looking at women in those particular areas. We are looking at children in those particular, particular areas. We are even looking at part of the uh, migrants who also form part of the urban population and mm. refugees, for instance, in this. Mm. And so even as we look at this youth population, we begin asking what are the respective needs of the respective categories of people? How can they be? What is the pro problem? Is it they have not been included? Mm. Is it they have not been planned for? Is it the financing that has uh, 
is not adequate by the end of the day mm. so that we can be able to know even if we are going to set progressive achievements by the end of the day we are able to achieve the our SDG goals actually SDG goal uh, number 11 mm. that speaks on the need to have a uh, inclusive uh, safe sustainable and resilient cities because 2030 is drawing near and so if we don't have these particular conversations if we don't move towards actualizing this particular conversation in CIDPs, if we are not keen to see that the annual development plans actually reflect what is in the CIDP, then we will be uh, dropping the ball mm. in terms of uh, moving forward mm. towards actualization of uh, the SDGs. Okay. Let's take a break. Okay. So, mm. you can pause with a question. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's 29 minutes after nine. We are talking about promoting a better future through Urban October. Urban uh, October. We are in October, aren't we? Yes. yes. Yeah. And Jamin Kuswani, who is the manager, Rebuild Advocacy. I would say it again. You know, every time I try and say it, I'm, I'm like, there's a way you said it. That doesn't sound like the way I'm saying it. Uh, it's Rebuild Advocacy Manager. Okay. <laughs> rebuild Advocacy Manager. Not Rebuild. Mm -hmm. No. It is Rebuild. Re hyphen. Re-build advocacy <laughs> manager at the International Rescue Committee. And Samuel Orlando is the executive director at Pamoja Trust. We are talking about what is it that we need to see happening to the population that are living in urban areas as we hurtle towards 2030 when everything should be done by then. You know, by 2030, according to the world, we should be in Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Uh, even as we are, we are looking at this, uh, we look at the you know development plans uh, around the country. Uh, the question then saying is, what will be then be different? Um, I, 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 I can understand and I see the case being made for um, legitimizing these plans, mm. putting them down in a policy document, with which at the very least the vanguards of these uh, projects can then be held responsible or accountable. I get that. But I think also now running the risk of having this cycle of planning and policy. Cycle of planning and policy. So I think the question is, in terms of hard, tangible action, what can people expect? Because I think about the people who are sitting in these places, in these urban centers, even, and they think, oh, we hear a plan about something for us. And they hear it every cycle. Ah, oh, they're going to do this for us. This is going to be done. We're going to have a better stab at, at you know, at, at existence. How can we see these brought to life? I, I want to give an example mm. of uh, the gravitation. You will notice that I don't call informal settlement slums. Mm. Mm. The post moi the, the Moi era and a bit of uh, the Kibaki era... Mm. The policy was that informal settlements should be demolished and cleaned as we clean the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you were doing that area, you were witness, witnessing a lot of uh, forced evictions. Yeah. And uh, then we noticed a lot of uh, human rights language, development language in uh, the Kibaki era. And uh, we started having conversations, I think, from 2007 on the new the national land policy and appreciating that people who live in informal settlements are human beings. So you cannot just carry out evictions, that they contribute to our urban fabric, mm. that they pay taxes, that there are people who support uh, our domestic, sometimes domestic services in the upmarket areas and such. Mm. So then, the language changed to informal settlements. And in informal settlements, when we call them informal settlements, you are agreeing that they are just informal we need to formalize mm -hmm. so that they become formal settlements and they were informal because but uh, they were not uh, you know uh, they, they were not in in sync with the urban urban planning policies they were not in sync with the urban planning act with our planning act and the houses perhaps there were no approvals that were being sought from the city council then and such so that then what we needed to do is to develop and that's when we know started noticing a lot of uh, settlement improvement programs, the Kenya National Kenya Informal Settlement Improvement Program, mm. which was a World Bank uh, funded project that was coming to government out of this agitation and policy documents mm. that uh, you know has uh, enabled a number of settlements to have security of tenure through title deeds. If you go to Huruma, you'll notice this. 
Jamin, I know you know a number of settlements in uh, in Mombasa and such. Mm. We had the Kenya National, uh, the, the Kenya Slum Upgrading Program. If you go to Kibra, the Soweto East Zone A, mm. the houses that we now have there that were being developed by the State Department on slum upgrading. Mm. And that's why we are insisting that unless it's in a policy document, that it may, may not give the populace, the 70 or 60 percent we are speaking about, mm -hmm. an opportunity to be able to hold the government accountable. Mm. You know, it may, it may not provide a framework for development partners to be able with, to partner with government to put resources to engage, you know, in, in delivery of some of these services. And as I conclude, and hand over to Jamin, is that any sense society should take care of its vulnerable populations. It may be through affirmative actions, you know. It may be through, you know, particular incentives that are being given to the private sector. And on doing this, from my perspective, then it's important that then the people are involved from the development stage and the conceptualization. Then once they are done that, then they are turned in the, the people turn themselves into monitoring and holding the government accountable because we are ex talking about expanding the the tax uh, tax base mm. by bringing more people to the to be able to pay their taxes but they can only pay that if they are leading dignified life if they are making income if you know they are seeing what their taxes do for them and that can only be achieved through the frameworks that we are speaking about and uh, i know sometimes when our civil society organizations when we demonstrate then it will only make sense to demonstrate and agitate mm. based on things that government has put in writing as a basis upon which they are to deliver ah, their commitments. So you want something against which to hold them accountable. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's why it gets into policy. Exactly. But it gets into policy as just words, Jamin. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get into policy accompanied by specific action plans and budgets because it's about resources. Say, for example, the issue of water, like you've just um, illustrated very well, mm -hmm. a 20 liter jerry can of water costing X amount of money. The person who is living in Mukuru ends up spending many times more for water than the person who lives in a neighboring South B. Mm -hmm. Many times more. Yet what this person is doing is basically buying water from somebody who's a vendor who is supplying via Mkokoteni. You don't know the source of the water. You cannot really um, talk about the quality of this water. So the solution is, can we get water to Mukuru? To get water to Mukuru. <laughs> it requires a lot of investment on just the reticulation system and all. That's a lot of money. The government of Johnson Sakaja will never be able to have a budget that can take water to Mukuru. Let's just be clear. The government of President William Ruto, through the Minister for Water, who is it going to be? Water and Sanitation? Uh, uh, Alice Wahome. It's not going to be able to do that work. So we're talking about it, plan, 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 plan. The, this person, that child will be born, that child will become an adult, water will never be in Mukuru. This phase of the CIDP, uh -huh. the national government has acknowledged one thing, which is that uh, we need to have a county integrated development plan. Previously, the approach has been we are having county government integrated development plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, this realization has been uh, because we have many people supporting in different areas, mm. but then everybody operating in silos. Mm. We have uh, this development partner, we have this NGO. When you look at the combined effort, it could be able to do something significant mm -hmm. to a particular settlement or informal mm -hmm. settlement. Mm -hmm. And so this time around, the county government and uh, the county government of Nairobi also, is that uh, they're looking at let bringing all partners together. What is your plan for the next five years on water? Okay. And so bringing all those particular partners in terms of what they want to do for water and county government doing their bid for water. Yeah. My understanding is that then this is going to have an impact than when everybody is doing their small project here for water, small project here for water, and they're actually targeting the same pop uh, population by the end of the day. Yeah. We acknowledge that uh, we are going to make... Uh, steps towards growing up these informal settlements, but it's not going to be overnight. And so if we consolidate all the efforts that are certainly happening 
in uh, pushing a particular agenda, then we are going to get there with time. But there's a question that you asked before we went for the break. In terms of, in the next, uh, between the 2009 census and now, we have a million people who have actually come to the urban areas. I think the way to deal with that particular aspect is to ensure that we have development in other areas away from Nairobi. Mm. How this particular country was planned was that the Nairobi became the administrative center, the commercial center. Everything was concentrated in Nairobi. Actually, you will be shocked to see that we have companies built in Nairobi who import raw materials from Mombasa and export a bulk of what they make. Mm. And so you ask yourself, how viable is the location of Nairobi yeah. than for that particular company by the mm. end of the day? So I think the more we have development and devolution, I think is answering that particular question in some of the particular areas, then you begin having people not willing to come to Nairobi because then we are having uh, the demographic challenges that we bring to the city, but then we are also developing other areas and therefore we are reducing the aspects of the rural and urban migration. But then the other point is, among the people who live in the informal settlements, the biggest bulk of their budget mm. actually goes to food. When you look at the cost of living crisis that we are currently living in, and you see that the 9.2 inflation that we got in September, and that when you compare two years ago and now, the cost of food has moved 50%, some of those particular commodities, then tells you that then food becomes one of the key issues that is affecting this particular population. And therefore, deliberate uh, effort to be able to cushion the very urban poor from some of these particular crises when they happen. Mm. And uh, we are happy and we are also pushing for that particular conversation in terms of how do we include people in social protection? How do we have safety nets that are wired to be able to respond mm. to this particular crisis? Because COVID came, it told us that uh, even with the little saving that people had made, they could completely be wiped by one particular crisis. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, in quick succession, we have in the cost of living crisis that is actually happening. And so we're asking for government and even development partners to be able to structure social protection in a way that it cushions this particular urban poor. We are acknowledging that within the demographics of the populations that we have, within the women we have, within the migrants, within the refugees, how can we be able to include these particular populations in social protection uh, safety nets, even if they will then need to contribute so that by the end of the day, once we have crisis, they can actually be cushioned by the, uh, by the end of the day. Mm. And so this particular conversation is then to bring everybody on board with, with practical aspects in terms of what will be able to fix each of the respective uh, challenges and problems that the people in the informal settlements actually suffer. You, you said something I think is brilliant and just coming off of that question that Eric had asked in terms of okay so uh, it's not going to be possible the way that governments and we're talking about national government and then we're talking about the 47 different governments they're not going to be able to meet the funding need for these social protection needs for these urban needs they're not going to be able to do it on their own. But we have had those with the financial muscle who have been in existence in this country for 50 years. They've been, let's just take the matter of water. I cannot count. I don't have enough appendages. I don't think we have enough appendages here to count the number of organizations that have come into Kenya who say they want to help with water, for example. So now when you talk about a consolidation of efforts, wouldn't it make sense then if these governments, when we talk about now, uh, Samuel, as you're talking about, at least let it be at policy level where the governments are now being held accountable for this. Wouldn't it make sense then if this policy by government were to console, to be a guardian in the consolidation of these efforts to say, okay, you're coming into Kenya, you want to work on water? You're coming and you want to work on water? All of you are entering into this basket and let's actually have tangible. I, I, I venture that if this had happened 20 years ago, we would have running water in most parts of the country today. But there is a duplicity of effort and then we end up with nothing. So wouldn't it make sense then if this policy that we are talking about for accountability then comes about where we have this consolidation at county level, at ward level, at national level, 
to actually see something done shouldn't that be the accountability exactly Since we have people with financial muscle who are coming into the country anyway exactly and that's what's happening in the sectoral working groups mm. we've got the land housing and urban development sectoral working group mm. we've got the health sectoral working group where non-governmental organizations community representatives county government uh, officials and directors in those specific departments yeah. sit down to visualize for the next five years you know the state of those particular sectors and then develop a plan out of it so that then as Pamoja Trust when I leave that space then I know this is my contribution mm. on land and housing mm. sector so that when another non-governmental organization comes to space and want to engage on an annual basis then they find their space mm. but then also Let's not forget that uh, this is a matter of uh, basic services or economic and cultural rights, mm. the element of progressive realization. So then we need to ask ourselves, is there progress? Mm. And how do we measure the progress? And also that let's not forget that the government has got an obligation. Mm -hmm. And the obligation is as to the environment it creates for non-governmental organization, for the private sector, and to regulate the investment particularly on basic services because we may also run the risk mm. of privatizing basic services the public one is not working listen yeah. come on what are we talking about the public one is not working <laughs> but it, you know even if it's not really privatizing <laughs> looking at public private partnerships yes. and i think civil society organizations mm -hmm. is high time now that you start mm -hmm. focusing on ppp mm -hmm. and how even the ppp law was created and crafted mm -hmm. does it work well for the beneficiary intended beneficiary communities mm -hmm. if we talk about law uh, sanitation yes article 43 mm -hmm. everybody has a right to safe house and sanitation blah 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 this and the other the government has signed very many you know mm. protocols we have the sdg6 we have i don't know the which protocol which mm. and that which which agreement which and all those we are not realizing mm. sanitation for all mm. we are just here talking mm. how do we look at ppps and how can civil society maybe actually now start pushing for for us to realize this for us to start making progress like you're asking uh, for us to start measuring the progress of the realization of sanitation bring in ppps look at the private sector what can you do how can you play a part in this in the provision of sanitation services as it is today water and sanitation services in nairobi are provided by a private sector of course <laughs> the, the the nairobi water and sewerage company is a private company it's only that it's owned by the county government mm. but it's private it's a company mm. right mm. so how can you bring in other mm. private sector companies to provide these services it's not, not necessarily privatization president ruto has said we want to talk about ppp in water provision mm. so if we if the civil society does not start playing that role in the conversation now it may be privatized water instead of Provide PPP for what? Like if this is the danger, <laughs> yes. That uh, the scarcity, and when the scarcity, we know that the private sector is driven by demand and supply. Mm. So then, the question that we will ask: What is the place of government in regulating pricing? Yes, but, because that's the major question. Yeah. For instance the housing sector we've opened for public private partnerships mm. and the question is that there's uh there's a demand mm. to what extent will government tell eric that when you construct houses in kibra then you cannot charge more than 4.3 million mm -hmm. when eric has invested 7 million mm -hmm. what is the practicality of that and that's the that's the danger with privatizing and that's why government, we say government has got an obligation and take people's innovations and legitimize them. When you look at the water sector, go to the informal settlement. You'll find a lot of youth groups running delegated water management models yep. where the Nairobi Water and, uh, and Sewerage Company brings water to a central place. And then this central place... The off-take can go Yeah, it's an off-take, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Then why don't you leg legitimize this? Why must we go and look for a private individual like Sam Orlando, to come and invest. Why don't we invest in the group? And that's why sometimes I think what we tried with the NYS, other than the corruption, the scandals that it had, was a brilliant idea. Mm. And it was a way that was going to allow communities through their innovations to change their settlements. Mm. So those are, it's, uh, there are two sides to it. 
and we need to tread on it, particularly when we speak about uh, basic services, with a lot of caution. Because it's also happened mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in, uh, in the health sector. I know. Yeah. I, when it comes to some of these services, I am a, a champion for basic services being provided by the government and not going to the private sector. But listen, I am not talking about privatization. I'm talking about the public-private partnership. So where, yes, the private sector is playing a role, but then it is through the support of subsidization by government, and that's a government role in it, which then gives the government the moral and legal authority to regulate. Regulate pricing, regulate your entry, regulate your participation. I think we, we, we are in a nice piece mm. where this is the conversation that is currently happening. Mm. Uh, because uh, when you look at, uh, for instance, access to water in the arid areas of Tukana and those particular areas, the, the study done around that area says that we can have lots of water to supply that entire region for 70 years, for instance. But then the cost aspect of it is too huge. That if we wait then for government to ever do that, they will never be able to do that in any financial year. Yep. Because the amount of money needed is more than what, for instance, we could be able to afford. Mm. And so I think the, the PPPs will answer that particular question in access to services. What we need to be vigilant about is uh, what is the regulation? We need to relook the PPP uh, law and see, does it only rent a benefit to the private sector or does it have benefit to the population? Is the social benefit greater than the capital benefit <laughs> true because when you i think one of the most difficulties that i have had mm. though with the uh, with governments and i think kenya and south africa is an example when it comes to article 43 rights the progressive rights it has become difficult because governments say we don't have resources we'll achieve because that's actually how the article 43 actually wired but then how then do we measure progress how do we measure that we are marching towards that particular goal become the conversation that uh, both the civil society needs them to be working towards. I appreciate that we are beginning to have those particular issues put on paper, that we are beginning to have uh, all actors then brought together for that particular, particular purpose to see that we can be able to play the role that each one of us can be able to do. I know... As, uh, some they are doing community for instance conversations mm. bringing communities together to voice what exactly are their issues looking at who are the vulnerable people that we have within the community how can we be able to bring together so that they can be able to air their issues so that at the very beginning when issues find themselves within the CIDP they have the inclusive voice of the people the article 118 on public participation I think it's beginning to gain that particular traction that you know what this is the grand norm of planning and, and development. Mm. And so that begins to give uh, insights uh, towards what exactly then is going to happen, what is going to be included uh, by the end of the day. And everybody playing their part. In terms of uh, policy, and do ask policies and bring everyone on board. Some countries, for instance, like in Uganda, mm. if you want to go and uh, have a program in Gulu, mm. the county government must okay mm -hmm. and the reason to okay they want to know whether you are duplicating what is already there what is already there mm -hmm. how do we build up and i think it's the same thing that uh, the county governments have begun taking cue from and i suspect that that has a huge potential of then uh, having developments happening uh, mm -hmm. by the by the end of uh, by the end of the day asking and i think we also suffer another problem the national government and county government have always operated as if they are distinct from each other. While we certainly know that uh, the functions in county government are going to be supported by, fun by other functions in the national government. And that's why even as we ask for social protection, we're asking what would be the role, for instance, of county government within this? Mm. What would be the role of national government? But also what would be the role of development partners? So that we do not always respond to crisis, but then we can be able to plan for this particular population. I like the discussion happening about how do we have, for instance, the social, the NSSF. How do we up the N NHIF to include everybody, mm. to include the people in the in the in the settlements, to include the migrants that we have, to include refugees that we have, because if then we do not do this, we know community disposable income yeah. then reduces by the end of the day. Mm. And as we go to the other end, we ask Jamin that if we increase 
contribution to NSSF, mm. what happens when the money hits the NSSF account? Yes. Uh, exactly, it's secure. <laughs> <laughs> well, NSSF will be lending to the government of Kenya, and then we'll also be lending to Uganda and Tanzania. <laughs> the same way we are lending, we are borrowing from France, <laughs> from their own savings. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Always a pleasure having conversations with you. Right? Always a pleasure. Samuel Orlando is Executive Director of Pamoja Trust and Jamin Kaswania is the Rebuild Advocacy Manager at International Rescue Committee. We are talking about Urban October.